Hi everyone, this is uh, Krishna here. I'm a principal technologist with Infosys and my group, which is the modernization group, does a lot of work with our clients on microservices, containerization, Kubernetes, a lot of modernization initiatives, mainly using CNCF projects. What we'll be looking at today is an interesting hypothesis about staying fresh, relevant as a cloud native architecture practice. Now, all of us who have worked with the cloud native landscape know that it is vast and many of the projects in the landscape, they are at the cutting edge of technology. So, knowledge in implementing, automating, productionizing this software, whichever project you pick, you know, Kubernetes, Opa, Kaiverno, Falco, uh, any project that you pick from the landscape, the knowledge, the skills that are required to productionize these projects in client environments is hard one. And what we do is we tend to document these experiences, you know, in terms of best practices, we tend to take what works and repeat that. And this can be in the form of, you know, a reference architecture. This can be in the form of maintaining an list of approved software products, which essentially are known to work well together. And every organization does this. However, my hypothesis, at least for today's webinar, is that open source moves a bit too fast for this strategy. Just think about what's happened over the last few years. We have had eBPF, we have had operators, which essentially allow you to extend the capabilities of your Kubernetes platform itself, essentially turning it into a control plane for other parts of your organization. For example, the way Crossplane turns your Kubernetes installation into a control plane for your entire infrastructure fleet. Similarly, there are other technologies that I haven't mentioned here. For example, Wasm. I'm sure there are some people who will say, hey, Wasm needs to be in here. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that's why we have a few blank circles in there. So insert your favorite technology. But that just proves the point that every two to three years, the cloud native technologies, the cloud native ecosystem has one or a few breakthroughs that essentially make things better. For example, eBPF. Uh, we have projects like Cilium that have just started based on the promise of eBPF, right? Just based on the promise of eBPF, Cilium started and it's now a service mesh. It applies uh, eBPF for security. It applies eBPF for observability. Uh, a very established project like Falco was rewritten in a large part to take advantage of this technology. So, yes, you know, in the past, maybe using reference architectures, using best practices, using sort of uh, a, a repeatable sort of approach to software architecture would have been perfectly fine. But in the cloud native landscape, in the world of open source, you may be leaving money on the table. So how do we tackle this? I mean, what are the solutions? As a consultant, I'm used to looking at every client problem with fresh eyes. And this is something that maybe is more applicable to the consulting world. If you are, for example, part of an architecture team that caters to um, uh, one company, right? I mean, you're, you're basically the architecture team for, uh, you know, let's say a, a Walmart or, you know, or a Boeing or one of our end users, then maybe 
every project does not need to be looked at with fresh eyes uh, but it helps it helps right and uh, the framework that i have sort of uh, put here it's it's again something that's from a couple of decades ago um, i think still very very useful is a framework called ferbs plus uh, which talks about breaking up uh, the client requirements into functional obviously and then non functional such as usability reliability reliability covers hadr also performance uh, performance covers scaling also including horizontal scaling which is um, something that we rely on a lot in the microservices world and supportability which is all about day 2 and the plus of course is all the other additional requirements that every client will have right for example if you are in a highly regulated industry like banking you will definitely have regulatory requirements in that um you will definitely have legal requirements in that so the plus sort of is a is a catch all there so as a technology architect my approach and and what i encourage people within our group to do is to stay fresh and understand not just the one offering or the two offerings within a landscape area right for example service mesh um you know security scanning um pipelines so instead of sticking to the one or two things that um or building blocks that you are comfortable with to instead familiarize ourselves as architects across the breadth of offerings and then look at the client requirement with fresh eyes and try to see if hey can i change up something here right can i go ahead and bring in a new building block or replace an old building block with that in mind uh, we start by looking at the service mesh area in the cncf landscape and you might all know that these are the three graduated service meshes that i've listed here uh, from cncf and i have arranged the service meshes in the order of graduation so what are we going to do we are going to take this hypothesis that you can look at products with a fresh eye based on client requirements we'll explore this hypothesis and try to apply it in the area of service meshes for that we'll look at what are service meshes just the basics and then have a look at the architecture decisions that were taken by the three leading service mesh uh projects the graduated service mesh projects from within the cncf landscape and how the architecture decisions make it suitable applicable for certain client requirements so we'll probably try to fit it in using a few use cases and uh finally we'll just wrap it up uh seeing whether this is applicable to other areas of the cncf landscape also so just the basics uh what's a service mesh um in my mind the genius of kubernetes is really in the api essentially what the api did was it allowed us to think about scheduling running workloads at a higher level and in a declarative way and just allow kubernetes to take care of the details now kubernetes is very strong when it comes to providing us abstractions for the workloads themselves kubernetes have different types of resources you know we have deployments we have daemon sets we have stateful sets we have jobs we have cron jobs so there are various abstractions available within kubernetes for allowing us to schedule run workloads however when it comes to other areas such as networking uh, there is a, a limited set of abstractions offered for example uh, kubernetes offers us the abstraction of um, a service and an ingress which allows traffic to be 
accepted into the cluster and for um, traffic to be routed uh, within the cluster to various spots. However, there is an opportunity here and that is where service mesh steps in. And a service mesh in my mind essentially offers a higher level set of abstractions for concepts such as networking, security and observability as we will see when we actually look into uh, the service meshes themselves. So where would you run a service mesh? Uh, the service mesh control plane is essentially that's the control plane for your service mesh that's, that provides the, the higher level abstraction that we talked about in terms of uh, networks, in terms of security, etc. This would typically run in a Kubernetes cluster but then your data plane, which is actually that part of the service mesh, which coexists with the pods that can typically run inside Kubernetes, co-located with pods, as I mentioned, or it could even run in VMs, uh, where the VM itself also participates in the overall service mesh along with uh, the Kubernetes pods. So that's why essentially the data plane is sort of spread across the cluster and we could also have nodes on uh, infrastructure external to the cluster. And of course, I've labeled you know the east-west and the north-south traffic here. As I mentioned previously, service meshes offer us high level abstraction for security observability and traffic management, which essentially is uh, networking primitives. Uh, let me give you a few examples. Uh, security, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the number one reason why service meshes are opted might probably be to do uh, mutual TLS uh, or encrypt all the traffic within the cluster, coming into the cluster, going out of the cluster. Uh, so that's probably the number one use case for a service mesh. Uh, the second uh, probably most popular use case is that the service mesh typically offers us better observability into the traffic that is coming in, going out of your various services. And that observability is quite useful in debugging any issues that arise, um, which is inevitable, you know, in a, in a distributed architecture. The traffic management capabilities of a service mesh are many. Uh, you could uh, use a service mesh to introduce rate limiting for your service. Uh, you could uh, do failover for your service, where if your main service fails, it is you know returning a uh, you know a 500 response. Uh, you can fail over to um, uh, you know a, a cache. Right? How many service meshes are there? The short answer is many. And at one point of time, uh, every company which had uh, like a reverse proxy or a, or a, or a, or a web server uh, was essentially building a, a service mesh. Within the CNCF landscape, there are three graduated service meshes. That's the one that we'll be looking at primarily. But apart from that, there are other service meshes. Uh, there is console from HashiCorp, uh, traffic, which is based on the uh, traffic uh, reverse proxy, uh, Kuma, which is based on Kong, etc. And uh, every cloud provider uh, also has a native service mesh implementation. Um, in this case, uh, many of these are actually based on Istio based on the open source bits of Istio, but then uh, taken in-house and, and developed further to be more compatible with that uh, cloud offering. So the answer to this question is many, uh, but what we'll be looking at, at least for this presentation, is just the three graduated service meshes. There are two ways service meshes work. And uh, here's where I think that whole initial point that we made around open source moving fast becomes relevant. Uh, one of the typical ways in which service meshes are set up 
is by using the sidecar pattern where within a single pod there is both the application container as well as a sidecar container which is essentially used to proxy traffic in and out of the pod and as you know within the pod all the containers share uh, the, you know the same namespace for networking the same ipc namespace and you can also share volumes within a pod that's how that's what makes the sidecar container pattern which is essentially a helper pattern very very powerful uh, because the sidecar containers can exchange data they can intercept all networking traffic coming in and out of a pod uh, they could also um, read and write to files which are there in shared volumes the way a service mesh uses sidecar though is to proxy network traffic and by proxying network traffic the sidecar which is part of the data plane of the service mesh is able to add security features like for example encrypting the traffic you know coming in uh, coming in and going out of the pod uh, it is also able to provide observability because all traffic passes through the sidecar is able to observe all the traffic it's able to um, give that observability to us and finally uh, traffic management capabilities since all traffic passes through the sidecar uh, rate limiting uh, failover all of that can be implemented um, at the sidecar level uh, for the service mesh there is another way service meshes can work and that is by using ebpf and that was the whole um, reasoning around the cilium project starting up uh, it was essentially the realization that there is another point where all network traffic can be tapped it does not require a sidecar so what ebpf does is it essentially allows a ebpf program to run in the kernel that is able to tap the network traffic at the kernel level and do most of the things that uh, service meshes offer as a functionality for example mutual tls um, it is very straightforward for the ebpf program to be able to encrypt and uh, decrypt the traffic that is coming into the pod so mutual tls can be applied um, at the kernel level of each node just using ebpf of course the control plane still exists the control plane still has to manage the overall orchestration it has to manage the certificates the identities of the various services it's uh, um, it's uh, data plane is talking to uh, but then what ebpf does by getting rid of that sidecar is essentially make it far easier to upgrade uh, make it far far easier to manage um, uh, uh, you know it just enhances the supportability of uh, the service mesh greatly and it reduces the number of moving parts which is which is a good thing in itself so as i mentioned um, cilium was the first project to heavily use ebpf to implement a service mesh um, initially istio actually hesitated to go down this path but then um, about a year and a half ago i think work was seriously uh, started on uh, ambient mesh which essentially is istio's version of um, offering these service mesh capabilities via uh, ebpf uh, linkerd has uh, stuck with the sidecar approach but then uh, there is talk of uh, ebpf making its way into the linkerd roadmap also uh, so here you can see the impact of um, sort of 
different projects having different architectures offering different sort of capabilities um, even within the same part of the cncf landscape and this is one of the reasons why wisely you know the technical oversight committee of cncf does not pick winners right i mean they say that we have a no uh, you know we don't pick the king or we don't pick the winners amongst um, our projects instead we just provide a space where um, all projects can sort of uh, innovate uh, just a summary uh, let's get into the projects themselves uh, the three graduated cncf service measures linkerd graduated 2021 istio cilium both in 2023 look at the architecture choices of each of these projects i mean this is what makes it so exciting makes this landscape so exciting that there are large complex projects that have taken independent architectural decisions and obviously there are pros and cons involved to these uh, decisions so uh, the speciality of linkerd is that the project stressors simplicity it stresses performance and it stresses on keeping things as optimized as possible and uh, to that end uh, linkerd has their own proxy they don't use envoy which is by far um, uh, you know uh, one of the most popular choices uh, from within the cncf landscape but what the Linkerd project has done is they have built their own uh, proxy. They have built it using Rust uh, to emphasize further, you know, that that simplicity, that correctness, and that you know, um, uh, you know, that resource utilization, you know, being frugal with, frugal with resources. So they have created their own proxy, and it essentially is designed to work with Linkerd, right? I mean. Uh, it's, it's not meant to be used as uh, a general purpose proxy like Envoy because um, the API, everything is geared towards being used in Linkerd. Uh, there are no guarantees that any of these will be stable, right? Because the Linkerd project considers this, uh, uh, their implementation detail uh, more than trying to create a, a generic proxy. Uh, in the case of Istio, and Istio has... Um, been around for a very long time and has a very large uh, you know, penetration in the market. Um, a lot of times when uh, our clients come and talk to us and they talk about a service mesh, uh, they're talking about Istio. Uh, so Istio has that, um, uh, that de facto uh, sort of position. And they use Envoy, which is um, um, a very elegant but complex uh, proxy. And uh, it has a lot of configurability. And this is the sidecar that is used by Istio. And finally, Cilium, as I mentioned, um, it heavily leverages eBPF. Uh, it's a sidecar less pattern to provide a service mesh. And I mentioned earlier that it uses sidecar, uh, sorry, uh, eBPF wherever possible. The thing about eBPF is that it operates at a kernel level and at a kernel level, you are at level four of your network, right? I mean, you are at, you are at a level of a net network where packets are coming back and forth. However, a uh, service mesh does offer some level seven features. And for those features, there is an Envoy proxy running at a node level, right? So it is one per node instead of running one proxy per pod. So right here you can see that um, the architecture decisions, the directions that the teams have gone in for each of these service measures is sufficiently different. And uh, that was one of the reasons why I sort of, um, I sort of immediately after Cilium graduated, I wanted to uh, create this talk. Uh, I've already given it once with an emphasis. And uh, it is just interesting to see how leading open source projects have taken different architectural decisions and the uh, trade-offs involved. We have also created a very, very small demo for 
each of the service meshes running on a kind cluster and the uh, the set of microservices for the demo is um, the excellent project that's provided by Google Cloud and uh, the load is generated by Locust. Uh, the AskNMR links are available uh, if you want to um, review them yourself. So let's get into it. Um, it's Linkerd first and Linkerd has been designed from the beginning uh, keeping in mind simplicity, keeping in mind performance and minimal resource consumption. As I mentioned before, uh, they have their own proxy. So this is the Linkerd proxy. It doesn't use Envoy. It's very lightweight, created in Rust. And uh, the diagram itself is from obviously the Linkerd um, architecture. So it is available on their website. So let us very quickly have a look at um, what this looks like running on a simple kind cluster. So I'm just sort of showing you what's running on the cluster um, and the number of namespaces. As you can see, Linkerd is installed in a separate namespace and Linkerd Wiz is basically an extension. It's used for uh, observability. Uh, there is nothing set on the namespace like a label or auto injection. Instead, what happens is uh, we are essentially using, uh, you know, the Linkerd's inject command in order to create and inject the uh, the sidecar uh, into each one of our pods. So this, again, you know, it's, it's like a testament to simplicity. Instead of having an admiration controller running in Kubernetes, like another component to um, upgrade, to maintain, etc., uh, you can just use, you know, the um, CLI to inject the uh, YAML for your for your sidecars. So this is, you know, one of the uh, examples of where Linkerd emphasizes simplicity. So uh, if you look at the pods that are running, uh, you can see that obviously we've got the usual cluster pods, but we've also got the microservices demo, Linkerd running and Locust also running in a uh, separate namespace. The microservices demo itself has multiple uh, pods, including for the front end, back end, etc. And uh, it's like a whole set of um, small services of pods that are running. Uh, just looking into one of the pods here, uh, we can clearly see that there is basically a container that is injected which is the sidecar and i'm going down and you can see that here you've got essentially the linkerd proxy uh, all of the environment variables that basically configure the linkerd proxy now envoy has uh, a whole full-fledged api uh, to configure it in various ways but then linkerd it is designed to be simple to configure also the linkerd proxy and that is done mostly by a set of environment uh, variables. So now we are going to go in and have a look at some of the command line tooling that's available. So one of them is basically giving us the basic statistics of how many services are meshed and things like request per second and latency. And we can also see the actual traffic flows going in and out of our of our various uh, pods and you can see that here that that observability is offered directly from the command line itself um, now i like this a lot because as a developer just being able to have this visibility in the command line is very powerful i'll just be able to do a kubectl logs in one terminal and then open a different terminal and actually see the detailed network flows that are going in and out of the various parts um, especially when we are debugging or, or troubleshooting uh, this becomes uh, very very useful so now we can see here that um, you know we can also basically format the entire thing as json and there's a rich set of uh, data that is basically shared for 
each of the network uh, flows that goes in and out. Uh, so finally, let us have a look at um, at a high level statistics of various traffic flows that are coming in and out of various parts and um, various paths or network paths also uh, within uh, you know the uh, various parts and you can see here that uh, this is a very very useful um, sort of view of what Linkerd uh, sort of is offering you in terms of observability how it's installed how it's injected we saw that it very much uses a sidecar pattern so now we move on to Istio and as I mentioned Istio is one of the older service meshes out there um, it uses Envoy as the sidecar proxy and this architecture diagram from the Istio site um, it basically depicts the Istio service mesh with the proxy architecture uh, now the Istio team is also working on uh, a feature called ambient mesh which will utilize eBPF and offer a proxy less architecture for the service mesh. Um, however, it is the proxy version that is generally available. Um, ambient mesh is still not GA. So I've, I've used the diagram that's corresponding to the uh, um, version with the proxies. Uh, as I mentioned, the choice of Envoy as well as the fact that Istio is one of the most mature service meshes out there means that the project as such is oriented towards configurability, it's oriented towards PAR, it's oriented towards allowing programmers and platform engineers to achieve as many configurable options or configurations as possible. Um, Istio also is one of the most powerful service meshes in terms of the amount of traffic management capabilities it offers. So now let us go have a look at uh, Istio running in a simple kind cluster. And similar to uh, the previous demo, I'll just show you the namespace. And uh, here you can see that there is an label set to enable auto injection in the microservices demo uh, namespace. Uh, this means that uh, the Istio proxy will be auto injected. Uh, when a new application pod starts up on Kubernetes. And this of course sort of talks to the configurability of Istio. It wants everything to be configurable set up by platform engineers such that application teams need not worry too much about how a service mesh is implemented, how it's running on the cluster. It should ideally be transparent to the application teams. Uh, so you can see here that again we are going into one of the pods and we can see that there is an init container that actually configures uh, the Istio proxy and there is an Istio proxy container also that is running as a sidecar you know within within the front end pod. In terms of the choice of Envoy, um, Envoy is certainly one of the most powerful proxies out there and in terms of all of the configuration it offers out of the box, um, it's also configurable via Wasm. Uh, so that capability to create custom extensions using Wasm is something that is very specific to, uh, to Istio at this stage. So finally, let us look a bit at uh, observability. And uh, what we can do is we can very quickly basically tap the logs of the sidecar and uh, see that in the Envoy sidecar, um, you know, I, I know it just sort of whooshed uh, by. <laughs> That's because a lot of logs are generated depending on uh, the flags that you have set. But then you can see that uh, the logs generated by the uh, sidecar are essentially giving you network flow level details. What happens with each of the requests that is going into the pod. Um, and what you would typically do is uh, you would Essentially, if you want to troubleshoot, you can use kubectl, have a look at this as you're sort of debugging your uh, workflows. Another thing that you can do, which is powerful is obviously to emit these logs as JSON and send it off to your 
observability platform uh, so that you can retain it for a limited amount of time you can uh, do various uh, analysis with the data such as overall latency and uh, um, other sort of parameters um, so overall um, this is just a small flavor of Istio it is definitely one of the most widely um, deployed service meshes out there uh, no wonder uh, given its focus on power given its focus on configurability and finally let's have a look at Cilium um, as I mentioned earlier Cilium was one of the first projects to adopt eBPF which is a kernel level technology uh, to sort of modify or customize or um, inject additional capability into the kernel without doing complicated you know uh, programming of kernel drivers or kernel patches or um, anything else like that and the advantage of Cilium obviously is that there is no sidecar right so every single pod that is running in your cluster uh, you don't need to upgrade it if the sidecar has an upgrade right you just need to upgrade uh, pods or maintain pods uh, based on applications uh, requirements uh, but then the same functionality as having the sidecar is achieved by having an eBPF plat uh, program running on each node via the Cilium daemon set and uh, that basically provides uh, a majority of the functionalities that are provided by the service mesh um, level 7 functionality you do have to have an envoy proxy running on each node but that again is not a sidecar right so you, you still don't need to have uh, a one sidecar per pod so that model is not being used in Cilium so this is something that's uh, very very exciting and Cilium graduated um, towards the end of last year and uh, as soon as Cilium graduated I knew I wanted to talk about the three service measures so as I mentioned that I'd given this talk internally within within Infosys also so let us have a very quick look at uh, what Cilium is all about uh, let us get into uh, a kind cluster where Cilium is installed and uh, as you can see uh, Cilium gets installed into your uh, cube system namespace itself and uh, there is a daemon set also which basically runs make sure that ebbf programs are injected into um, each of the nodes uh, same thing the microservices uh, demo is running here and when we describe the front end pod uh, we can clearly see actually <laughs> in the uh, pods itself that is all one of one so there is just the application container running uh, there is no sidecar running here uh, but at the same time you are getting um, the convenience of having a service mesh including mutual TLS implemented at a cluster level um, Cilium has a project called Hubble and that is basically the observability platform and the Hubble CLI as well as UI gives a lot of options in order to filter and see the network uh, flows happening. Uh, this is one of the more usable, uh, you know, command line tooling that is used for observability, I'd say across the landscape. Uh, you can see that you have very, very fine grained capability to go ahead and um, uh, you know sort of filter uh, and do other things with the flow logs that are generated and finally I'm just sort of um, showing you how you can obviously format this as JSON also uh, so within Cilium uh, Hubble is observability um, there is also another po project called Tetragon which uses um, eBPF for security uh, this is the service mesh part and the Hubble part that we that we had a look at out of the box um, very simple to set up uh, day two operations are um, obviously um, quite simple because you don't have to deal with upgrades for the sidecar alone right especially any security 
um, conscious environment or constrained environments where uh, things like CVEs are being tracked very closely, you may be forced to upgrade an application just to upgrade the sidecar in some cases. Um, that's you know that's uh, not a problem with Cilium. Uh, on the con side, um, uh, there is basically um, some analysis required around the security model of having a sidecar versus uh, eBPF because eBPF uh, runs as a privileged uh, program within the kernel and all the network flows pass through that. So it's sort of like a, uh, a single point of attack for, for any threat actor. Um, on the other hand, if you look at a sidecar, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, trust is distributed in a way uh, because every sidecar is privy to only the flows within that part. So it is uh, a stronger security model. Um, having said that, security in eBPF remains a very, very serious area of work. Um, even as of a year ago, eBPF programs could only run as root, but uh, work was done and now eBPF run programs require a more uh, focused set of permissions. And I'm sure that more work will also sort of uh, continue to be done in this area. So a lot of pros and cons, and I think it'll be interesting when we look at some use cases as well as um, see why it's important, right? To familiarize ourselves as architects, as consultants with the breadth of offering in any given uh, CNCF area. What was the original hypothesis? The hypothesis was that in the cloud native architecture world, uh, we need to be familiar with all of the offerings across the landscape. And especially if we are a consultant uh, dealing with different clients, uh, the payoff is obvious, right? Because every client will come with their own permutation and combination of various factors such as this. And what you typically have, you know, similar to my organization is probably uh, an Excel or an application, internal application with um, each of these being broken into dozens of questions. Uh, probably you'll have like hundreds of questions uh, going across, uh, you know, all of these various criteria to try to figure out the fitment, right? And in many cases, what happens is that clients do have unique needs and as a consultant we have to give them an optimal solution so let's take some use cases you know use case a a client doesn't want frequent updates but is highly security conscious this might be iot this might be manufacturing this might be trading um any sort of situation where the client is a bit sensitive as to how many updates are getting pushed through, but then at the, th at the same time, is security conscious enough to be tracking every CVE and trying to maintain the least uh, security surface area possible. Uh, so something like a sidecarless solution might be very ideal for this customer, right? So example B, you know, client wants a service maps that Mesh that's FIP certified. Uh, for the longest time, that used to be Istio. Um, I think Linkerd has also got FIP certification recently. So that again sort of narrows down the choices, right? Depending on the unique client needs. Suppose the end user wants a spectrum of functionality. That's case C, right? And this might be a case where reliability is key, right? Even with all of the um, platform level features that comes with Kubernetes, like, uh, you know, auto restart of pods, you know, spreading prods across AZs, all of that increases reliability. But then maybe there's a client who is used to putting his services through the paces, testing thoroughly before promoting anything to production. It might just be, you know, like an organizational culture thing. And in that case, You'd, you'd sort of go for something like an Istio, which just has everything built into it, right? Everything possible. Uh, it's very featureful. 
uh, so delays fault injection doing something custom maybe including uh, uh, you know using wasm um, all of that is supported in istio so what have we achieved we started with the hypothesis that given the vastness of the cloud native landscape architects do need to develop breadth across any specific area in the landscape uh, we looked at the various service meshes the graduated service meshes from cncf and we saw the various architectural decisions taken in those projects and hopefully uh, by the end we are sort of convinced that we can improve the end user journey by internally not just ourselves but within our architectural practice developing that breadth um, you know specialize in one offering but then be comfortable or know where the rest of the projects in the landscape in that specific area are applicable and this works with any specific area you pick up um, you know for example you know helm versus customize as i as i was mentioning earlier um uh, you can definitely see that one may be applicable in one place where, whereas especially if you are in a consulting practice uh you may end up suggesting something else to another client just based on their unique circumstance uh, so with that um i hope this has been as enjoyable for you to watch as it has been for me to make and uh, all the very best out there Thank you.